Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Bonnie Oglensky, and I'm a professor at the CUNY School of Professional Studies, um, and I am the academic director of the sociology program and the human relations program. I want to welcome everybody to our webinar this afternoon, Why We Love to Hate Hipsters. Um, and this is meant to uh, give everybody a little sense of levity at this point in time in our country, in our world. I think we could all use good chuckle. Um, I want to also just point out that we had used the word loving to hate hipsters. And um, when we say hate, we mean it facetiously. So anyway, welcome. And um, I'm going to introduce now uh, Professor Terry Anderson. Uh, who is a, a professor of sociology at UCLA and also at CUNY SPS. That's CUNY School of Professional Studies. And um, she and I are going to have a conversation this afternoon about um, hipsters and hip and cool. And um, we're going to take your questions at the end. I'm really thanking you all for participating in this and being here. So we'll save the questions until the end. Um, and I hope everybody who needs to be signed on now is. And um, so let's get started. Hi, Terry. Hi, Bonnie. And uh, good afternoon to you and good morning. I'm uh, calling in from Los Angeles. So it's actually my 9 a.m. Great. Well, thank you. So yeah. Um, Let's just plow right in and talk a little bit about a course that you teach um, called <laughs> or about hip, hip uh, cool and yes. hipsters. And why why did you create that class and how did that come about? Yeah, it's called Hip and Cool, a study of distinction and exclusion. And um, I, I think there's three three stages to how that happened. The first was I got called a hipster and um, that was so confusing to me and annoying too because I knew it was I knew it was not meant to be a good thing. It was I think it was in 2005, and of all places, it was in a student evaluation um, of a, a, a sociology of family class. There's like 150 huh. students in the class, and it's at UCLA. And someone wrote something like this hipster, and I went, wait a minute, what? First of all, I didn't know what they meant. Um, my context for hipster at that point had been you know Allen Ginsberg's Howl poem these angel headed hipsters and and it was it was definitely not something I was thinking about um but I knew that this was meant to be kind of an insult and so it bothered me and being confused bothered me too and so that was just like it was it was noted okay so someone uh -huh. thought I was a hipster I don't think uh -huh. they're right but I don't know what this means so that got me to pay attention a little bit um part two was well, I live in the Silver Lake neighborhood of Los Angeles, which until I think fairly recently was was the national epicenter of hip or actually hipster. Hipster is more appropriate because hip and hipster are, are very different things and one depends on the other, but they're they're different. And that's something we'll talk about. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I've just been working. I teach at UCLA and academics, as you know, are very involved in our work, very hardworking. And uh, I hadn't been super aware of what was happening in the neighborhood until one day. It felt like I woke up and I was surrounded by hipsters. And it was mm. certainly a local phenomenon and a national phenomenon. And it felt like a, really an invasion. I mean, it had changed the composition of my neighborhood. And going back to about, I'd say the mid, like early to mid 90s, Silver Lake had always been, uh, you know, hip, seen of kind of a a more like underground appealing place where you go if you want to be if you want to be seen as in the know or if you want to enjoy kind of alternative culture that's not what it is now um but uh you know i i had known that but i moved here because i wanted a community which it still is uh, and that was the correct choice but you know i saw that oh these these very different people are coming in and they're not what i'm used to seeing Part three, and, and where the course actually came from, was I was staying with a friend in New York. Uh, you know this person. It's our friend Kim. And she was um, doing research on the art scene in Bushwick, which I now realize there's kind of nothing more more hipster that you could study. 
um, so her work was steeped in cultural studies and I was staying with her and happened to look at her bookshelf and saw a, a book jump out at me. It's, it's a bright pink cover. So it, you know, popped out and it's called What Was the Hipster? And it's a provocative title and, you know, she was working. So I had to occupy myself, took it down and looked at it. And it was, it was a set of papers um, and presentations that were for a conference in New York by N plus one, put on by N plus one. Um, and they're, a, you know, a hipster publication, I think like self-defined. And so it, it was all these kind of different, different kinds of commentary on hipster and hipster related things. And it was meant to be kind of what we're doing, like a serious but playful academic analysis of the situation. And so it, it was a really interesting set of writings. And then one of them was called On Douchebags. And I just thought, oh, that's really funny. And so that, that really caught my attention. But then I got back on the plane to come back to Los Angeles and did this really academic thing, like something I do to amuse myself. I make course syllabi. Um, it's weird, I know, but I just, I just thought, well, there's this phenomenon that's, that's clearly culturally noteworthy, this hipster thing. Um, I don't totally understand it, but this book was so interesting. Mm -hmm. And one way I teach myself things is I, I make courses on them. And I didn't expect to ever teach this course, but by the, by the time the plane touched down in Los Angeles, and this was, I think, 2010, 11 maybe um i had sketched out an entire 10 week uh you know academic quarter course on the hipster and it was play it was fun um and i and i really wanted to understand what was going on in my neighborhood because that's very important to me and then yeah i did not expect to ever teach it but then ucla said hey, we'd like you to teach a social psychology seminar uh topic your choice and i said well i have this let's do this and then i said about like you know really really grounding it in academic literature as well as pop culture references that that brought the you know the more hardcore serious literature to life so that's where it came from and now i've taught it i think seven times and uh it's been good i like it a lot great yeah. So, so it's a, definitely a topic that um, calls for analysis. Yeah. Um, in addition to being playful about it. Um, yeah. So, so let's let's talk of, with some definitions. Um, yeah. What what is a hipster? Okay. So the hipster, the hipsters. Like I think there's two understandings of the hipster. There's the one that most people kind of reach for, the thing most people get, and then there's one that is that is deeper and speaks to the dynamic within which the hipster lives so what most people think a hipster is is um it's composed of like uh doings and wearings i think like it's mm -hmm. it's the kind of thing you wear it's your accessories it's the music you listen to maybe it's your social scene um and that's it and mm -hmm. that's not wrong it's not wrong but it's kind of a shallow and um i think an, an incomplete definition um because the hipster actually exists through the entire last century um and john leland from whom i take a lot of a lot of my ideas he wrote this book called hip the history he's a new york times journalist um he he rooted hip in the 1800s with thoreau and whitman and melville uh he rooted that rooted hipness in terms of philosophy well, hipster, the word goes back to, yeah, I should look, but it, the 30s or the 40s, right? Um, we had hipsters in the 50s. The beat poets were hip. The people around them who, you, you know, were called beatniks, that's hipsters. Um, we have in the 60s, 70s, we've got more to hippies. And the modern hipster phenomenon is more like late 90s and then through the aughts, like early 2000s is when it, uh, early 2000s is when it became a kind of noteworthy cultural category for, for the present time. So, yeah, I remember talking with a neighbor and he said, well, I'm, I'm wearing this baseball cap. That makes me a hipster. I, and I said, no, <laughs> no, definitely not. I was right in the middle of teaching the course and said that, no, it doesn't work. Sorry. Uh, he said, why not? Well, if you think it's just an accessory, then, you know, your, your San Francisco Giants hat would work just fine, but it's not. Um, hipster needs to be understood in relation to hip and hmm. just, uh, that's good. NPR. Tell us the distinction between hip and hipster. 
Yeah, they're very different. Hipster only exists in relation to hip, and hip is what hipster wants to be. So there's an NPR piece that just came out. I was their kind of their expert for that. I'm reporting on the hipster scene in Atlanta. And um, that's online. She, the the author Lauren Booker called it my uh, my my ripple theory. And again, it's actually kind of originates with John Leland. But um, what I said is it's, it's like this. Like think of um, a set of concentric circles, okay? Or like if you drop a pebble in a still pool of water, you see the ripples will come out from the center. What's in the center is uh, I guess you can call them the prehip someone who's not hip, someone who um, kind of definitively not hip, like some people would call them a geek, a nerd. It's, it's a person who's really interested in, you know, some, some phenomenon, something, some doing, you know, it might be someone who, who likes a really obscure band. They don't like them because they're obscure, right? Mm -hmm. It's just they, they happen upon this, this band or this style of music or, or mm -hmm. this artist or, you know, something, and they love it. They love it just because they love it. And it, they're very, perhaps very serious hobbyist and probably a creator of some sort. That's the pre-hip. And the reason they're pre-hip is because no one is paying attention to them. No one knows what they're doing. You know, like a, if a hip person walks through the forest and no one sees them, are they hip? No, they're not. They're not hip yet. Um, and, they're, and they're not asking to be seen. No, not at all. And that, and that's a re thank you. That's a really important thing to point out. They're not asking to be seen at all. They're just enjoying the thing they're doing. Mm -hmm. w what makes it hip is when other people start to notice what they're doing and say, "I love that," right? And we'll join in on on in engaging in the the activity, the phenomenon, whatever it is. You know, perhaps they develop a little culture around this. Like we all love the music of this particular band from 1961. And you know they only made one album ever, but we love it, and and so it's obscure. So what? But you know we we just we really enjoy this music, and maybe they they all like uh, create neckties that match what the original singer would wear, and they all wear those just because they're you know they're they're bonding with each other in love of this of this music. Okay, so. Those people, are they hip yet? Well, I'd say they become hip when they're noticed as positive by someone outside of the group. And that could become the hipster, okay? So mm -hmm. you're, hip, you're hip when you're noticed as doing something that is, that is seen as positive and that is outside of the mainstream. You're not mm -hmm. doing it because it's mainstream. What it becomes relevant as not in the mainstream is when someone starts emulating it, but they don't get the substance of it. That's the hipster, right? That is the hipster. Say, Talk say, a little oh, bit more about that. I will. Yeah. So the hipster yeah. is the one who's, who notices maybe maybe the special neckties they've worn, maybe you know this this inside group. And they're, again, they're not trying to be inside necessarily. It's just it's their culture. It's their private thing. Um, and these and these private group identities sustain us too, right? We define ourselves through our our in group and often our out group identities. Mm -hmm. um, so the hipster is the person who's who's looking at this, who sees this, who says, "Oh, it, that's that's interesting because no one knows about it." Hmm. See, that's very different from what the the person engaging in the phenomenon is doing. They don't mm -hmm. care about inside outside. It's just it's their thing. But the hipster mm -hmm. is ah, that's exclusive. That's exclusive. And through the exclusivity, I define myself, right? Mm -hmm. So that's when you get someone who starts listening to the same kind of music. They may or may not enjoy it. I mean, they may enjoy it very much, but it's not like they were part of the primary group and it's not like they spontaneously found it, although they will probably claim that, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. just, uh, oh, there's this, there's this thing that's different. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the time it is doing it to be different notices that perhaps they start wearing the same kind of necktie as this this private in group and then a trend develops around that but the trend of that music listening that necktie etc it's 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 baseless right it's not it's not grounded in say anything other than itself right the trend itself mm -hmm. um and then what spreads is the the trend right not not the insider understanding not the deep understanding not the deeper phenomenon certainly nothing creative other than accessorizing right it's so there's a copy 
it's absolutely absolutely it's a copying and i think that is you know this this webinar is called why we love to hate hipsters well the one of the most common things for a hipster to say is i am not a hipster mm -hmm. and people who are actually not hipsters would also say that truthfully but mm -hmm. the hipster is saying i am not a hipster because what a hipster is is inauthentic mm -hmm. and the reason they that we don't like them they're so annoying is they're very judgy <laughs> they judge they're extremely judgmental right and they're and they're judgmental of other people who they would say are not as authentic as them but that is exactly what the hipster is not they are not authentic if authenticity if the authenticity of say the original experience resides in having discovered that music yourself enjoying it for what it is developing your own subculture the hipster is is none of these things mm -hmm. they're copying but they also get things sold like you know they're they're wearing this phenomenon and the hipster is the popularizer right they would never mm -hmm. identify themselves as that but they're the person who's kind of the the in between between the inside which almost no one ever sees which is the mm -hmm. truly hip the creator mm -hmm. and then the mainstream mm -hmm. which is the hipster is the one who wants to be on the inside but really isn't mm -hmm. but almost no one knows what the inside is Mm -hmm. And so they think the hipster is the inside and the hipster is only too happy to say, yeah, I'm the original and I am very, I'm the most authentic. Mm -hmm. And that is where status resides in this mm -hmm. claim of authenticity, right? Mm -hmm. We are mm -hmm. not authentic there. Hopefully that's so what is, so the connection, I have the, the slide of marks on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what, what's the connection then between the claim of authenticity. I, um, I am the most original of this kind yeah. of person, or this kind of music lover, or this kind of. As you and I have watched a video recently about the, the most, the, the most uh, authentic kind of water. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, so funny. Um, what's what's the link? Is there a link to that and the idea of being away from the mainstream or being a part of the mainstream? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, mainstream is, is seen as, as being just copies. Mainstream is not special. Authentic is seen as like the core and mainstream is the people who are copying everything. And and that's kind of true. You know, that it's like you could say, you know, we might talk about the concept of, of over. Um, in Portlandia, I had a, an episode where Fred Armisen did, a, I thought, a hilarious piece where he, you know, is following this, not meaning to, but keeps running into this guy around his neighborhood and, and the guy ends up doing whatever Fred Armisen's character does. And Fred Armisen mm -hmm. thinks he's hip. Maybe he is, maybe he's not. But the guy who is emulating him, I don't want to say just copying, but emulating him is, is um, he, he sees as, oh, you're, you're a hip you're a hipster and every time he sees the guy, whatever the guy is doing, which is exactly what he's doing, he says, it's over, it's over. And then he stops doing it. He'll literally throw the things he's doing away, like toss them into the garbage. Shell art, it's over, it's over. Um, because it's it's a copying, which is probably what he was doing anyways, but once it spreads past your immediate circle, once it hits the mainstream, it's no longer desirable because it, it, it's, it's like it's diluted, it's diluted the specialness of your exclusive mm -hmm. area, mm -hmm. right? Like once it once it gets to once it gets to target, it's not desirable anymore. It's it's mm -hmm. been copied and copied and copied and marketed. And you as a hipster, as someone who is seeking like the you would hope for like the core experience of something, which you never really get to, um, but you're seeking that, you want to say, oh no, no, okay, so that's that's just it's been watered down, it's been copied too much, it's not particular to me. And authenticity and specialness are not the same thing, but they often reside in the same places. Mm -hmm. So um, is there any way to think of hipsters <laughs> as authentic then? Oh, man. <laughs> um, I pushed a button, I think. No, I'm just thinking, like, how do I make sense of that? It's um, they're they're real hipsters mm -hmm. you know they're real hipsters i mean they're authentic for what they are but they're not authentic for what they're claiming to be mm -hmm. um I, I just you know i think of the you know many people i know and a lot of them are the the hip which there's also two ways that hip can be used i think maybe more than two but i'm thinking of two and 
most people think hip is the end thing, mm -hmm. you know, the end thing. But the thing is, if you can find a restaurant on Yelp, it's certainly no longer hip. Mm -hmm. um, it can be very much in, but mm -hmm. it's, it's certainly not hip because once it's been Yelped it's been too, so much, it's like, it's not insider anymore. Right. Um, so what is your question? What is, is there any way a hipster is authentic? They're authentic as being an authentic hipster, but mm -hmm. the authentic hip is the person who, who is the creator, right? The creator of whatever. Um, mm -hmm. I, I look at what happened to my neighborhood and this is, you know, we can talk a little about, I guess, the path of gentrification mm -hmm. and my neighborhood is so thoroughly gentrified by now. Um, it was uh, in the mid nineties, you know, I would say it was, it was genuinely hip and there was, it was, it was less known um, among creative types. It was more known. And um, you know, the artists could afford to live here. The musicians could afford to live here. But what happened then is it, it became known as, you know, something of an insider, more underground thing. And so the people who want to be seen as insider, but who did not participate in creating that culture themselves, start showing up and then they and they will often have more money and they price out the the artists the musicians the creatives who built this creative culture in the first place and those people have to move um, around here it's usually further and further east um, and so the hipsters you know took over and then what happens is the hipsters popularize something um, they don't want it to be more popular, definitely not, because then they have to move on to something different because the whole point for the hipster is, is to be with things that are not popular, that are not mainstream, because that is what makes them special, that they, you know, the knowledge is currency and that means status and you lose your status if your knowledge is not exclusive. So can I, can I, think, I just stop you there for a second? Cause I really, sure. I want, I, I don't know if we can really explore this issue, but it seems like there's such a paradox in what you're saying. I mean, on the one hand, um, declaring yourself as special, doing things, wearing things that make you special, can't really, um, it's not intrinsic to the person. It's something that has to be recognized by outsiders. Oh yeah, absolutely. So, and on the other hand, once recognized by the outsiders, I mean, is the idea that the outsiders then won't emulate that and that they could be left to their own special devices? Well, it never works that way. I mean, if you've no. been successful in, in, in showing that something makes you special, other people will want that, mm -hmm. you know, that's what we human beings want. We want, we want status. And I think, I mean, the topic of, you know, I feel, I feel funny about the course. It's, it's a really solid and the whole topic, right. It, it seems so trivial. It seems so trivial to say, we're going to talk about hipsters. And if you're talking about like people who are hipsters, individual hipsters, uh, I think they are kind of trivial. Um, but if you're talking about the dynamic in which they exist, the dynamic that actually creates the hipster, that's not trivial at all. We human beings live on status, right? We love this. This this determines your life chances. You know, this determines work you get. This determines your friend life. Status is so important to us. So the hipster is this example, right? It's It's this case study of how status is created and how it is maintained, which mm -hmm. I think ends up ends up making it a lot more important and a lot more interesting than you would think for something as trivial as a hipster. But yeah, that's that's exactly right. Like it's I don't I don't think the desire is, you know, it, I don't think it's in the case that like there's this desire like, oh, I don't want mainstream people to copy me. I think uh, the point is more in the participating in what they hope is the hipness, you mm -hmm. know, participating in something that actually is exclusive. Mm -hmm. But think about think about anything you've ever been involved in. You know, I think for most of us, there will be some example, something you've been involved in that that was just you and a few other people. It doesn't mean it was hip, but just something that you loved that was that was unique to you and your group and then someone or several someone showed up who who weren't really interested in mm -hmm. in the meaning of what you're doing and they didn't really know you um and they didn't really care about you or what you were doing but they started copying it do you want any more to continue participating in that you say oh man you know i used to really like this but now these people have totally changed the meaning of what i'm doing it doesn't mean you were hip. it doesn't mean they're hipster but there's that dynamic of mm -hmm. people who who aren't you and they aren't your friends but they're mm -hmm. they're kind of taking over 
this mm-hmm. thing that you like to do and then you mm-hmm. say oh that's i i'm not with them i'm not mm-hmm. one of them and mm-hmm. you know they've taken this thing for your, themselves i'm moving on mm-hmm. and that is that's the dynamic of over mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. so when you ask is it the desire of the hipster for mainstream people to never see it well it's not that desire the desire is just to be popular really mm-hmm. you know it's very very common human thing but within um, but within a, a particular group w- well with yes within a particular group and not and not the people who you don't want to impress and and mm-hmm. that's the mainstream the people who are totally mainstream um it's it's poor hipsters though because by popularizing something by showing that it is kind of exclusive again that's currency and that's what people want and that's what ruins the hip neighborhoods is is you know people come in it's it's not necessarily the case that oh you know we don't want their money it's that they change the meaning of this thing you love that they change the meaning of what you were doing in the first place and that's why that's why things are over right it's wait a minute that that doesn't that's not me anymore and especially you know if you made this from the ground up you were the person who actually made that kind of music Mm -hmm. or you created that whole genre of art then people coming in and and copying it and making it into something that you don't like something you never intended and changing the meaning of who people think you are Mm -hmm. say wait wait a minute this this is not me i need to move on so Mm -hmm. yeah and and another thing that is so it's such a burn about the hipster is they you know they'll tend to stay with the trend if they're really a hipster um they they may eventually move to hip like some some may get really involved in the phenomenon but but the kind of what the hipster typically does is they just try on they try on skins you know they try on outfits they try on whatever is popular and of mm-hmm. course popularity never never stays and so when that goes, they'll they'll be on to the next trend, having, you know, I guess ruined it for the people who originated it. So and gentrified that neighborhood on the way. So what's in now for the hipster? I don't know. I don't know <laughs> okay. actually. I mean, it, it's. I think when you look at back at the early, early aughts, like you know, two thousand two, like a porn star mustache was in, um, and that that was seen as ironic or or like. It's a video, I think it's still on YouTube, called um, The Hipster Olympics. And you'll get a really good picture of what that was about. I think it's a great, it's a great video. It's very funny. Um, but you see the trends then. And I think people now can still recognize those as being hipster, but people don't really do them anymore. I mean, like six years ago, you could still see people with these kind of bushy, bushy mustaches, um, sometimes beards. Um, three, four years ago, even not so much now, not so much. And, and part of it is those things mainstream, they become mainstream accessories. And part of it is the things that are kind of more, um, some, some things just never really translate to the mainstream and, and they disappear, you know, especially if they were just being tried on as a, as a trend and a bid for status anyways, they'll just kind of, you know, melt away eventually. What is hipster now? I don't know. Okay, I just want to say that the slide that we have on now, I I found um, <laughs> while I was preparing for this. Um, so, uh, what int- what intrigues me about the slide is that it suggests that there's a real um, there's real work that goes into producing the hipster. Of course, any uh, image, yeah, yeah, right. So, can you talk about that a little bit? The work that goes into producing the hipster. The production um, of an image, really. The production of an image and buying stuff engaging in activities um what what has changed with that um i think is interesting is something it is um, the method through which people learn about what you know what what trends they want to emulate and that is something that's changed life for all of us in the last say you know 15 years and that's the internet it's technology um whereas before it, it you used to have to be on the scene to to get your your hip inspiration really you mm-hmm. you had to be there you had to go to that club you had to be in that neighborhood you had to see people walking on the street um you know not necessarily have a conversation with them though that that would increase your status probably if you could be seen with them um but you you had to be in those places now with with the internet um you know digital media cameras posting images online you don't have to be there at all and the images transmit um it, you know instantly of course and so i think it brings um 
even more shallowness, I think even more shallowness to the hipster, right? You, you didn't even have to be there to pick up this style. Um, and so to, I just wanted to throw that in because it doesn't exactly answer your question, but how do okay. you, so the question is like, how do you build an image? Um, these days it can be just, you buy stuff and you put it on, you know? So you, speaking you of it. buying, speaking of buying stuff, um, what's the, uh, I don't know, the obsession with nostalgia and with cultural appropriation among the hipsters? Yeah, authenticity. The word is authenticity. And mm -hmm. it, once, once you get that that is core to understanding the hipster, you can understand a lot more about the many phenomena around the hipster, right? And, and again, why we love to hate the hipster. It's a claim of authenticity by someone who is so deeply inauthentic, right? The claim that I am just like, you know, it's an implicit claim. The person doesn't have to say it, right? But their, their style screams it, right? I, I am authentic. I am an insider in this culture. Well, you know, what's real about the hipster, what's authentic about the hipster, it's, it's just that they're a hipster. They're a real hipster. Um, but what they're claiming is a reach beyond hipster culture. Because, again, the desire is to be the real thing. <laughs> to be the real thing is not to be a copy, it's to be a creator. It's the difference between consuming and creating, okay? If you're the real thing, you're a creator. You're creating the music, you're creating the art. You made up that style yourself. This is why it's important to, to latch on to something more obscure, because if it's really quite obscure, most people won't recognize that you didn't create it yourself. In fact, no one will unless they're in that original hip culture. So you're kind of mm -hmm. safe there. Mm -hmm. Authenticity, though, authenticity is where the status came, comes from, right? Authenticity. And so that's what the big claim is. I'm authentic. That's why the hipster is going to say, I am not a hipster, because the definition of hipster is inauthentic, right? Inauthentic, mm -hmm. but claiming to be authentic that's hypocrisy okay and inauthentic while claiming to be authentic and judging other people for being inauthentic when that's exactly what they are that's not a very nice thing um so you look at like a you know a fixie bike it's it's fixed gear bike it's like it's 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 authentic it's i know i know the inner workings of my bike uh, you know everything everything is about authenticity mm -hmm. it's about being the real thing but you know, so much of it. You know, it when, it, when it gets to the public eye, it's probably a copy. It reminds me, remember the book, uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance? Yes, I do, yes. So there's this kind of um, des desire, it seems, a, a cons consumer desire to um, um, be original and be the first um yeah. and and to have priority um yeah. and there's always a pecking order involved in that which Absolutely. is really i think lays its groundwork in in many different trends over the um over the course of the evolution of society Absolutely. Um, so now i have the picture up of these two guys who are <laughs> have like apothecary jars i guess this is a candy shop i think it's in brooklyn uh -huh. um and again, there's this kind of um, evoking of old style of nostalgia, right. and right. Um, uh, and it's really it's really quite interesting to see that there's this pretension yeah, <laughs> um, that that's really endemic to this idea of um, we are uh, revisiting something that is so old and um, so forgotten that we're go we're going to bring that back. There's this, there's this phrase used, and it's now so widely mocked, but it's a really hipster thing to say, like, I like, you know, this style, this music, et cetera, et cetera. You've probably never heard of it. Uh, I you've probably uh, never heard of it. Right. Um, and that and that's the thing. It's, and, and not hearing of something, something being obscure in itself doesn't make it hipster, right? Like, I on my UCLA website profile it says you know she's she's doing research and visiting very tiny towns across america but you've probably never heard of them but that does not make them hipster um right they're just they're just unknown mm -hmm. but if you can claim that something is unknown and then and then flaunt it as something that you as an insider know mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. you're first you're on the inside right you've probably never heard of it and the obscurity and your claiming of the obscurity for your own 
image makes you uh, an insider and that gives you status. Mm -hmm. So much of insider status is, is manufactured by who you exclude from your group. Yeah. So interesting. So, so let's go back to this issue of cultural appropriation, because I think that this is a part of and also has some distinct uh, elements to, yeah. to the hipster identity. Yeah. Yes, so, I'm, so let's, uh, I'm showing a picture of a guy with a mohawk. Uh, yeah, kind of. So let's talk about that a little bit. It's authenticity again. I'm going to say go right back to authenticity, right? It's this person. He's he's he did not originate the mohawk. Um, Casma okay. Cafe. Okay, so here's. All right, I'm go going back, back and forth now. My 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 phone went on the keyboard. Sorry. Go that on. one, the Casbah Cafe, that's a few blocks from where I live. And that particular cafe no longer exists. And that was a big, uh, it's a, you know, fuss in the neighborhood. I mean, that was a much loved community place going off on a little tangent now, but seeing, seeing this, you know, coffee, coffee house I used to go to a lot. Um, it's very sad. It was, it was important for a lot of people. Uh, the place next to it doesn't exist anymore either. That was kind of a more hipster craft place. Mm -hmm. the, surplus, the surplus army store in the other corner is still there. You could say that's original hip, right? That's not aiming to be hipster. That's super insider. It's the genuine army surplus center. But the Casbah Cafe, I mean, this is what's happening all over our neighborhood and all over the country. Like they, I think they tripled the rent and, um, the Casbah Cafe could no longer exist there. And guess what's there now? It's another coffee house and it's a chain. So it's a genericizing, right? Genericizing. Mm. The original yeah. is pushed out. So here's here's this young woman uh, engaging in obviously an act of cultural appropriation. And I think, again, I mean, the way I understand it is, again, you're reaching for authenticity, right? And the authenticity is is supposed to make you cool, but you're claiming something that you don't own and you did not originate. You do not own it. And more important in the point of uh, cultural appropriation is if the people who did originate this were, were seen wearing this, engaging in it, it would not give them status. It would take away their status, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's like people have been persecuted for mm -hmm. being genuine members of this culture, persecuted, mm -hmm. killed, right? And mm -hmm. for you to take just this, this accessory and say, isn't it cute? You know, it makes me look so hot. You are showing lack of awareness and, and through that trivialization of the culture from which you are borrowing mm -hmm. accessories, right? That's cultural appropriation. Mm. So and there's a way to against this. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's offensive. And so it's Halloween right now. And you'll probably see plenty of cultural appropriation <laughs> across the country and in the neighborhood. People are growing more more sensitive to this, but certainly not everyone. And there's a real lack of understanding. Right. And and that's the thing. It's not sure if history hipster are just homage. That's funny. Um, these are funny. Uh, that's a funny photo. Um, so yeah, it's that's the thing is is the difference between seeing something as integral to culture and identity, which mm -hmm. is the same with the the kind of the original hip person. It's like what they're doing, like the music they're making or the art they're making, they're doing that because they have to do it. Or people who are in a, a particular subculture, right? They're engaging in that because it's been in their family for generations and it is there it, it's crucial to their identity. And then when you step, you as an outsider step into, you know, say a, a hip culture, which never cared about being hip culture, but it has to create, right? And, and just starts pretending to be a musician like them, but with no skill or pretending to, to make that kind of art, but, you know, with nothing but kind of a derivative understanding and no skill, right? That's offensive to the original creator when you borrow elements from a culture without having to pay the price for using them or without having them indicate things about who you really are that can certainly i think with validity be in, interpreted as trivializing and mocking those who originated that culture and who not only do participate in it but who must participate in it and for whom it is a crucial part of their identity mm -hmm. yeah like taking something without paying the price so speaking of paying the price um 
we'll probably uh, we'll talk a little bit more, um, a few more questions, but I wanted to turn our attention to the commodification that goes on with the hipster. So you talked yeah. a lot about buying things that make you a hipster. Um, and certainly the market is very sensitive to hipsterism these days. Oh, yeah. um, so we have this kind of these um, cultural appropriation of this kind of Native American design. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember who the designer is, but there's a whole fashion show, that uh, whole runway show mm -hmm. of, of this kind of um, cultural appropriation, which in this um, instance equals being a hipster. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so and there are there are all kinds of ways, and we talked about the, the Kasbah Cafe, so coffee shops are really central. Yeah. Uh, so, as I scroll through a few more slides about commodification, maybe you could talk a little bit about the market and hipsterism. Sure. Well, hipsters get things sold. Okay, hipsters sell things. Not, they're not um, trying to market things. Certainly not. And if you told them, they would be horrified. Right. Mm. Um, again, they're trying to project authenticity and be taken as authentic. They're not, but they're you know attempting to gain status through exhibiting uh, insider insider status and excluding anyone who is not in their in-group, which is not really as, in, as much an in-group as they're trying to convey. Mm -hmm. So this is the way it works with uh, the hipster getting things sold. So a hip person is not going to get anything sold. Um, the hip person, remember, is just one step removed from pre-hip, which is, which is probably pretty socially undesirable. It's someone who's really on the outside and, and like they, they don't fit and it's not cool, right? It, it's, they're on their own. Then they get their hip group, again, this ripple theory, right? And then you have the hipster notice them. The hipster makes things much more commodifiable because they're taking just the superficial, typically. They're taking just the image. And, mm -hmm. you know, they engage in those activities, those, you mm -hmm. know, formerly hip, now hipster activities, wear the stuff that they think is cool because they think it's insider. But, you know, ironically, I guess they're moving it to the outside, the mainstream. Um, and so what happens is there's this, there's this thing called a cool hunter. I, I think it was Malcolm Gladwell wrote an article on that too. Um, cool hunter. And this is a person who, uh, will you know be part of a uh, a company uh say clothing company uh, and they'll go they'll go literally to the streets looking to see what the trends are what trends are are bubbling up and it works mm -hmm. the other way too i mean but mm -hmm. but if they want something really on the inside they get out to the streets uh they can hunt more on the web now too because again technology has has changed things um the images are you know so easily transmitted but the cool hunter will go to the streets and just see, you know, what sneakers are being worn, what styles are being developed, and they'll take those back to whatever their company is. And, you know, whatever works will be woven into, like, the designs. Um, and I think this tends to be, initially, it tends to be like a smaller boutique, like, you know, maybe a few t-shirts will be made or, you know, a couple of handmade pieces will be made. But it's where the meaning of the piece has been divorced from its origins, right? Mm -hmm. It's the person who's wearing it is not making it. It's make it's being made to be sold. And then someone who's, you know, maybe anthropology or urban outfitters will pick up on that trend and it becomes marketed as something that's hip or hipster. If you're a mm -hmm. self-respecting hipster, you will never call yourself a hipster. Mm -hmm. But stuff is being marketed as hipster as if it's a good thing. Some people mm -hmm. think it's it's cool. And that just means that just means you're in. At the point that it's being called hipster by urban outfitters, it is it is most definitively not hipster, right? It's it wannabe is, wannabe. It's one of so it's that's that ripple, right? It's one more ripple removed mm -hmm. from the inside. And mm -hmm. then, you know, like I said, once it gets to Target, it's over. It's it's like, you know, first it's in the streets, then it's people copying, you know, the one or two people they see mm -hmm. using this style on the streets. And then it's a cool hunter comes and finds this style and, uh, you know, makes a few pieces with this, works it into their show for the coming season, something mm. like that. Then it trickles mm. down to mass marketed stuff. And then it moves out to completely the mainstream. And mm. it's several steps earlier where the hipster has decided it's over. 
right? Mm -hmm. But when it moves out to say the super mainstream target, you know, something like that, it's where urban outfitters will probably say, okay, we're not doing this anymore because the desirability, mm -hmm. the status has been ruined by it being available to everybody. But it's, it's right. the cachet, it's the status, it's the insider thing that, that gets right. it sold. Yeah. Right. So, so to return to where we began as we end, um, let's talk about um, why we love to hate hipsters. Um, yeah. And, and is, um, who's benefiting? Um, how do we, how do we make sense of the dynamic and is it good for the culture? You mean the dynamic of hating hipsters? Um, the both the dynamic of having hipsters and the dynamic of love loving to hate because I think that that's the the loving to, the the loving part is very important I think in the dynamic from what you say that there's this kind of um, there's almost a sense of um, a, a status that goes along with loving to hate the hipsters. Um, if you reject, if you're if you're a person who rejects the hipster, then that means that you're declaring yourself then as exclusive or wow. somehow yeah. superior to the hipster. And I think that's where norm core comes from, right? Norm core is this movement. I, I don't I don't know if we're really doing norm core anymore, but it's people dressing just like in the most completely normal, straight, unembellished way possible. And that is that yeah, norm core. It's the backlash. Uh, it is absolutely, and that is a way of stepping, and that's a style in itself, right? And it can be very carefully curated. Oh, well, it's an animal on his chin. Um, it's very carefully curated uh, <laughs> style. It's a great picture. Um, well, also, Terry, notice free your skin in, on the bottom right. This is a um, an advertisement for uh, for shavers. <laughs> yeah, um, this is the anti hipster stuff. shaver. Yes, it is <laughs> mainstream. My it's, colleagues in the, in, the, in the studio here are snarling as they're looking at the picture. It's great. Oh, it's yeah. very funny. It's very funny. Yeah. It's chick, feel your skin. And it's mainstream. It's saying, well, yeah. you, you embellish yourself so much to catch up with a trend and look at your sleeves on your arms, you know, these, these tattoos. Just yeah. step, step out of the constraints of wanting to be popular and just it's, it's locating your true self in rejecting trends. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. That's that's really interesting. Okay, yeah, so yeah. <laughs> um, even uh, this is this last slide that we have about um, uh, selling beer that is that's not for hipsters. Um, is... Yeah, because hipsters are bullshit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Garage it's it's basically saying we have substance. This beer, you know, it says if your bike only has one gear, ride on, which means that's the fixed gear bike, and and it would imply obviously you're a hipster. It's everything in this screams hipster, right? You've got the beret, you've got the bow tie. These are hipster tropes of a certain era, right? And we can still recognize these as hipsters, even if people aren't so much doing them anymore. Um, right. So it's saying if your bike only has one gear, which means you're a hipster, this is not your beer. All beer, no right. bullshit. So it's saying that the hipster is bullshit, which. Yeah, it's true. I mean, if the, the bullshit resides in, again, the lack of authenticity by someone who is claiming that they are definitively authentic. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so mm -hmm. underneath all of that, what the marketers of this beer are saying is our beer is authentic, right? It's no bullshit. Mm -hmm. It's not claiming to be something it's not, but it is the real thing. Mm -hmm. It's not pretending. Mm -hmm. It's not pretending to be, you know, a fixie bike expert when you're not. It's not pretending to be, a, you know, a beret wearing beat when you're not. It's, it's um, we're authentic, which means what the beer is claiming to be is hip, which is the ultimate well, I mean, status. It's so interesting because the beer needs the tipster to make this commercial. Yeah, but the thing right? is, if, if it if it is, you know, publicly marketed like that, it's definitely not hip right it's mm. definitely not mm. insider it's 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 kind of a funny dynamic to mm. to use ultimate insider as a way to sell something through the mainstream mm. it's not true and that is again bullshit but it, it's status so this has been a tour de force <laughs> in <you>. hipster <laughs> hipsterology um, it's fascinating Terry. It is. It is totally fascinating. I'm wondering if anybody has any questions. Nobody's written in to let us know that they have any questions. They might not um, have known you do. could. Um, 
other questions give out you, there? Give you, give you a moment. Um, you know, ah, we have one. Is there a link between hipsterism and socioeconomics? Oh, Good absolutely, question. absolutely. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And the hipster is typically the one who brings more money. It's the person who pretends they don't have money, but so often this is stereotype. Not every hipster is wealthy, but but hipster is typically more wealthy than the hip person, right? It's someone who, and again, it's, it's, it speaks to like the the you know emulating someone's pain when you actually don't have any of your own you know mm -hmm. the artist the artist very often is not wealthy at all and has to make extreme sacrifices to to make the art that they truly need to make right mm -hmm. to 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 be who they are they have to make that art and they have to live in you know run down warehouse a dangerous neighborhood etc the hipsters moving there just because it's cool and then once the artist makes that neighborhood cool by putting their heart and soul into it their blood sweat and tears uh the hipster comes along and says this is this is cool right i i, I claim this for myself but i claim it not by truly joining your community and creating but by buying it my bringing in my money and buying it mm. and and that's and that's gentrification right i mean it's a it's uh, you don't automatically gentrify a neighborhood. I was just reading about this the other day, right? You don't automatically gentrify a neighborhood if you're different from the, you know, the, they say the, the previous inhabitants. You don't automatically gentrify it if you're different or if you are in certain ways a part of the dominant culture. Um, if you move into that neighborhood and integrate and respect its norms and participate in its, its rituals, its routines, its culture, you're not gentrifying. It's when you come in, you imagine that you discovered it. You know, yeah. you're the, you're the yeah. Christopher Columbus of that neighborhood. Yeah. Wow, I, I discovered this taco truck. No, you yeah. didn't. The residents have been eating there for the last 20 years. I right. discovered it. And then because you come in and you take what they're selling at the taco truck and you triple the price and you and you you buy the you know you buy the truck and you force them out of business and then you triple or quadruple the price of what they're selling and you sell it across the street in a in a brick and mortar location um yeah your money has ruined that neighborhood your money has mm -hmm. stolen the authenticity and you've stolen something that uh someone has has produced probably from mm -hmm. the heart of their culture and now you 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 know you've taken their livelihood you've stolen their identity and you're profiting off of it. Mm. So, so it looks like there's some themes in the questions that um, and the comments. Um, there, there's is the theme about um, class, about social class, about money uh, uh, in gentrification. Mm -hmm. But there's also questions about race and ethnicity. Um, how does what role does race play in the dynamics of historism? Sebastian Torres is asking, and I think that's a really good question. Hipsterism, uh, what role does race play in the dynamics of hipsterism? Huh. huh. There's, uh, mm, I, okay, first of all, I don't feel, I don't, I'm not ready to have like a really full answer to that. There is some kind of sideways responses I can give. Um, first, just to start with again, I, I think always start by looking at where, where authenticity lies, right? Um, and there's often this assumption that you know the the people engaging in uh, the culture of their ethnicity. Um, I feel like ethnicity is the better thing to say than than race, um, social construct, anyways. Um, that those are going to be the authentic people, and that those are the people whose whose whose. Uh, cultural trappings are going to be, say, appropriated, stolen by white people. Like that's the typical dynamic. Hmm. Um, it's the expected dynamic. Yeah, that really happens. Um, another thing that um, hmm, the, the African-American hipster uh, now, see the, the slide you used to market this was some, some African-American folk wearing what would be seen as, as typical hipster gear. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought, mm -hmm. I thought they looked fabulous by the way. They look so great. Um, <laughs> but back about, I'd say 10 years ago, 15 years ago, there was nearly no such thing as a black hipster. And the term was invented for it of lipster, right? 
And that like it's it was seen as a just a, a weird phenomenon. You almost never see a black hipster. And if they were, the way that they would show their hipsterism was by emulating the style of white hipsters. Hmm. Right? Hipster hipster is seen as being a, a white thing, a white thing. And that is because I think that the white people tend to be the privileged people who who come in and have the money and will buy out and thus essentially steal creativity and culture. There, does that help? Oh, well, I, I think it's, it's certainly an open question. I mean, I think that there's also questions um, that nobody's asked, to, but, but some that got raised for me in preparing for this uh, conversation about uh, gender and mm. about um, a, a seemingly dominant focus on men as hipsters. Yes, um, absolutely. That's true. And, and so I, I sort of, it sort of begs the question of what, what's, what's up with that? You know, what's happening with that? Uh, yeah. And, and there's been, it's been a little bit written on that. And um, I was actually thinking about that the last couple of days when, you know, getting mentally ready for this, this webinar. Um, I think that is rooted in just sexism, period. It's not sexism that is exclusive to hipster culture. It's, it's American sexism, it's worldwide sexism. Women are marginalized nearly everywhere. So hipsterism is, is no exception and it's certainly not totally egalitarian. Yeah, it, it so, mirrors the sexism of American culture in general. So I'm gonna, I'm, uh, on behalf of uh, one of the participants who, who I know, I'm going to ask the final question, which is kind of a, needs to be a playful one. The estimated number of hipsters in the United States. <laughs> I don't have a clue. <laughs> I have no idea. I, I don't know. I don't know. And I, and I have to think that that shifts day to day because the hipster is, it's like, and I, it's a practice. Okay. And it's, um, kind of an obscured identity that people try on and they can shift in and out of it. It's temporary. It's temporary. Hipness, hipness is more something that is core to your being. And, uh, you know, from the outside, it, it, it could be seen as, you know, claiming some really deep status, which I guess it could be depending on the extent to which it's recognized. But really what the hipness that gets emulated is, is stuff that people don't really have a choice about whether to do or not. You know, I think about the musicians I know, the artists I know, this is just who they are. It's not It's not a, a mustache you can grow or shave. It's not a hat or a dress or a coat or a pair of funky shoes that you can put on and then take off um, when you decide that trend is over. It's who you are mm. and you live it and you die it. <laughs> so amount of hipster is changing constantly, I'm sure. Mm. So um, we have a few other questions which we're not going to be able to get to this afternoon, but um, they have to do with the identity, uh, sort of philosophical questions of, you know, so would a hip person never know they were hip? And that's maybe, from, maybe because they're not, again, they're not doing what they're doing to be hip. It, they're, they're, and again, the hipness is not decided by the hip person. It's, it's, um, you know, it's it, it's nothing without kind of a cultural context in the context of being noticed. And another really kind of core sociological question from Patricia. So we're all doomed to be labeled. Be <laughs> hip, we are. Hip or normal or norm. And then finally, from your own Klein, our last question. Can someone be asked if they're hipster and tell the truth? Uh, sure. Depends on the individual, depends on the individual, and it depends on, you know, everything we say does something. Back to the labeling question, mm. if you consider labeling uh, the product of being doomed, then yeah, we're doomed because that's what human beings do. We label, mm. right? We label, we categorize, and that and is where we- yeah. yeah, we do. And that is where we find our status as well. It's how we develop our status, the groups, our in-groups, our out-groups. And then what was Yoren's question? Um, uh... Well, uh, can someone be, I think you answered, can someone be oh, yeah. asked if they're hipster and tell the truth? Uh, yeah, that was the last question that came in. It depends on what you want to claim for yourself. I mean, certainly everyone has the ability to do that. Um, and I think if a hipster is a hipster, they probably know they are. They may not admit it to themselves, mm. but they probably know they are and are a bit ashamed of it. 
And mm-hmm. because again, they want to be authentic. Like you really mm-hmm. want to be authentic. You really want to be the insider and the creator mm-hmm. and the originator, but you probably have an idea or not. You may not admit it to yourself, mm-hmm. but yeah, you know, if you can, you would wince. You might you wince, wince at the question. It depends on what you publicly want to claim for yourself. If you publicly want to claim your deep authenticity, you won't admit it. But yeah, they have the ability to. Anyone does. Well, Terry, this has been a delicious discussion. Great. Um, I am. Thank you very much for uh, your insights and um, your willingness to uh, share what you know about hipsters. And um, I want to thank all the people in the uh, who've participated and um, look forward to, to more and more discussion. Excellent. Have a great afternoon. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye, all.